Hello, everybody. It is wonderful to have you here today. I just wanted to let you know straight away that we will be going through um, quite a bit of information, but as soon as we get started, we will um, hopefully answer some of the questions that I know some of you have. I know we've had a couple of emails just asking us things like, exactly what am I, what have I gotten myself into? What is the um, expectations on the behalf of Teach First? I know that people were concerned about a few different things, and we're going to address all of those today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Renaissance Star Assessments, which is a collaboration between Renaissance and Teach First. And for this project, we are just going to look at a couple of different things. But what I wanted to do today is just make sure everybody knows what the product is, how to use it, and so on and so forth. So what I was going to ask just to start off with is whether or not you are able to attend the conference, the Teach First Impact Conference. And I know um, Sean and Harry and Jim have already told me that they haven't been able to. And would you be able to just fill me in as to whether or not you were you were attending, you were able to attend to that conference back in July so that I know whether or not you've had any of the training so far. It just means that we'll structure it slightly differently if we know that there are all attendees in the room that are okay. Oh, I don't think that they can hear me at this point. All right, so we will come back to that in a moment. So our company is focused on making sure that every child, every adult, has the opportunity to accelerate their learning, whether you are using our STAR assessments for math or whether you're using our STAR assessments for reading. Both of those things are specifically focused on making sure that children can make that accelerated progress or that outstanding progress that we're looking for as teachers. Um, to introduce myself, I am Lauren Shapiro. I am the Senior Program Manager of the Renaissance School Partnership. I came to the company three years ago after having used the products in my own school, um, where I was a teacher for about five years. I was teaching in a secondary school in London. I taught um, all the different year groups, but in particular, I was in charge of Key Stage 3 for English, and I was literacy coordinator, so I used STAR assessments for reading, specifically to go and look at how I could close the gap between reading age and chronological age. So I just wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping things. Terry's covered some of this already. There are just a few different icons you can use, whether it's raising your hand, using picture crosses if you agree or disagree, or putting up emoticons when you're prompted. So could everybody just give, use an emoticon to tell me how they're feeling today? Just show me that you know where those things are. That would be great. Oh, okay, I see that everybody's feeling pretty happy. Fantastic. We are too. Very keen to go through this with you guys and then hopefully finish up a little bit early so that you can go and enjoy the sunshine outside. What we've done is we've structured it so if you've already imported your data, we're going to go through that in the end, at the end of the session. I'm actually going to pass everything over to Jess to go through that. And so if you're a little bit worried about importing data, you can stick around and we can take you through that. And if you are not worried at all about that because you've already done it, like I know a couple of people have over the summer with us, then you'll be able to nip off a little bit early. So just very quickly, um, we also have our chat feature. Would you be able to please put into chat whether you're using STAR reading assessments or STAR maths assessments, just so that I can see whether or not you have the one product or the other. So we can break down whether or not it'd be better for me to show more with maths or more with reading today. So just in chat, just tell us if you have reading or do you have maths? Or if you don't know, if you tell us you don't know, that's okay too. Let's see, we're still waiting. It's okay if we um we need a moment. I see a couple people are joining us now. If you're just joining us now and you can hear me, welcome. Um, I was just asking if you have star reading or star maths for your school for the assessment. Did you sign up for reading or for maths for the testing? Okay, I can see Sean and Harriet have star reading. That's wonderful. Um, hopefully we will hear from a few other people soon too. If anybody else does want to pop that into the chat box, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I can see that Lydia says we have the reading one. Fantastic. 
That's all really wonderful. Thank you so much for filling us in. If anybody else does want to add theirs in, we can do that, and we're going to just keep going for now. I wanted to start by talking about the behind the scenes stuff. So what exactly is Renaissance Star Assessment? It's a computer adaptive skill-based assessment that is linked to the national curriculum. For both reading and for maths, what it does is it takes the national curriculum and it breaks it down into all the different years, looks at the end of year standards, and asks questions to figure out where children are within the assessment. What is unique about it, it is one test. It doesn't matter whether your child whether the child is in year three or in year 11, they use the same test and the same scale. It is one of the few assessments out there that is actually like that. And so what is nice is if you have a child who's in year three, who's working so far above and beyond where they normally would be, and you perhaps don't know what's in the key stage three curriculum, but that's what they're ready to access, you can go and find out from our test what they're ready to do next. And it's all linked directly to that national curriculum. Similarly, if you have a child who's in year seven, which having been key stage three coordinator often happened where they were not working at year seven level, even though they should be, they were working more at a year four level or five level, rather than having to go and pull up the national curriculum for key stage two um, and go back and try to figure out what are the skills that they were missing, what do I need to go and teach to go and pull them back to where they need to be, the test will go and fill you in on that. And so it saves you some time along the way. Um, the other thing that you can do with it is you can help use it to determine which of your children need your support most urgently. It tells you who's working at benchmark, who's in need of intervention or urgent intervention, but most importantly, who's on watch. So who are those kids who are most likely to slip through the cracks, who are not on the SEN register because they're not quite weak enough, but who are not accessing their year level curriculum. And finally, it allows you to track growth and progress. And by going and using all of our tools, you can find out quite a lot about how your children are performing and what you can do with them next to get them to move forward and have that accelerated growth that we all look for. So Teach First is aiming to find out whether or not Renaissance Star Assessments are an effective and reliable tool. They want to know how you're finding these things. And so really, this is a chance for you to go and trial everything out and see how it works for you. They, as part of the project, have obviously bought all of the STAR assessments for your schools, and they have a few expectations of you in return. They just would like to see that you assess your students three times a year using the test. And they'd like you to do that under exam conditions or testing conditions. So if you think about what you normally do for SATs or what you normally do in terms of GCSE expectations with your school, if you apply those same conditions to make sure you get an accurate response. And they'd like you to attend the training so that you understand how it can be used to move forward. So what we've done is we've put together all of this training on the Teach First hidden page on our website. So you do need to type in the exact link that is shown here in order to be able to access that. But what you will find is a breakdown of each half term in each month, exactly what you need to do for that month, what the expectations are for Teach First. It's really not a lot of work on your part. You just need to basically have your two classes of kids working uh, and taking this test three times a year, and that's all. Beyond that, everything else that you do with the system is up to you. So there are a few opportunities with this. You can obviously use it as you wish to monitor progress. We do suggest you go and you test a fourth time in April or in March, depending on whether you want to do it before or after the April break, just to get that extra assessment so you have your baseline in September and then you have one at the end of the first term, the end of the second term, and the end of the year. You are not required to do one at the end of the second term, it's just a recommendation. You also get a chance to receive training on an assessment program where normally the training actually costs quite a bit, so it's tied into the package that normally schools pay for when they buy their licenses and their sites. Teach First have paid for all of that for you, so you get free training, which is quite an exciting thing for you if you would like to know more about what you could do. If you're a school that's completely new to Renaissance, you get to find out whether or not you think this is actually a useful tool for your school. And if you're an experienced school who may already have one of our programs like Accelerated Reader or Accelerated Maths in your school, that's okay too because it means you get more in-depth training on the areas that are new on our site that you may not be familiar with and also where you could be using features perhaps in a bit more depth. 
having used the program for five years in my school, I can tell you coming to the company, I did not know half of what was in that system. And I was finding out new things every day. Even now, I'm so surprised every once in a while when something sneaks in where I was like, I didn't realize it did that. And it, part of it is that they go and they update it constantly. So you can use the data in lots of different ways. And in the future, we're going to do webinars on how you can use the screening report to track intervention needs and decide who can be best helped by the SEN team. You can use it to track growth and decide whether or not you're getting enough growth from your students in terms of either reading age or in terms of numeracy um, and whether or not they're accessing where they should be in the maths curriculum. And then you can also go and very quickly create personalized intervention plans using our learning progressions, which is something that we're very excited about. We basically have unpacked the standards for you, and we, have, we hired the National Foundation of Educational Research to put them in a teachable order. So there's a lot of very exciting features within our site, which we won't necessarily go through today, but I promise we will go through in future webinars. What we want to do is we want to make this as simple as possible for you. So what you're going to go, what we're going to go through today is exactly what you need to do now. And we'll touch a little bit on what's coming in the future, but it's really just going to be, if you leave the session, you should be able to go off and you should be able to start test your students and meet that goal for the end of September. So how does the test work? It's a computer adaptive technology. Now, because I have covered some of this in the session at the IMPACT conference, can you just give me a ticker across if you were able to attend the IMPACT conference? Now that we have a few more people who are in the session, you can see Jem hasn't. And I know Sean and Harriet were unable to. What about everybody else? Were you, were you at the IMPACT conference, the Teach First IMPACT conference in July? We did do an hour and a half session there. And so if you did attend that, it might be a little bit of a refresher today of exactly what you need to do. But we will go through some things that hopefully are a little bit new to you as well. OK, excellent. I don't see anybody else going and giving me a ticker across. If you can't find the ticker across, it's right below where everybody's names are. Oh, perfect. I can see that we have at least one person who's put in a number, so I don't know who that is in terms of names. But thank you so much for responding. And I can see Lydia was able to attend. Laura was unable to. So hopefully we'll be able to cover some of those key things. So the way that it works is that the computer adaptive technology starts out by asking a question to the kids that is between six months and a year and a half below whatever year they're at at school. Um, so that only thing it knows at the beginning is the student's age and their year. So then that first question should be pretty easy. If they can answer it, then it will get easier. And if they can answer it, it will get harder. So if they answered it correctly, it will get a little bit more challenging. Answer that one correctly, it will get even harder. They answer it incorrectly, it'll get a little easier, and so on and so forth. So even though we only ask 34 questions of the kids and they can do this test in about 20 minutes, we can find out really precisely where they're working at and we can get quite a reliable score because of that. And the way that it does that is it uses item response theory. So it works on the basis that if we know that this child knows that their shoes go on their feet, if that's where they're currently working, then that means they already know how to identify what shoes are. We also know that the things that they're probably ready to learn is how to put them on their feet. And the thing that they may not be ready to do yet is learn how to tie them. And it works the same way with either reading or with math. So whatever question they're asked, and because I know a lot of people said that they are using the reading test who had responded earlier, if you're using a math test, can you just pop that in chat? Um, I'm going to use reading as my example for now. What we often find is that if, for example, a child is able to read a sentence, we know that they have basic phonemic awareness. We know that they know their alphabet and what letters are. We know that they can probably work out the order of their letters and read simple words. If they can then work out that, we know that they may not yet be ready to move on to paragraphs. It depends on what the, where we then ask that next question. So we would ask several questions to really pinpoint where they were on the scale. So what we need to be doing at this point in the year is we need to import our data with the correct dates of birth. Now, we have sent you an example spreadsheet, and we are more than happy to take you through this 
individually. So if you want some support with going through how to import your data, you can just go and put a message into chat and Jess will come back to you with her email address. You can email her and we will set up a time to do this over the phone with you so you don't have to worry at all. What you do need to do is because Teach First have overall administrative access to the system, what you'll need to do is import your kids without their names. And so we're suggesting you go and use your school's name and then a number afterward. We do need you to make sure that the correct dates of birth are attached and that their genders are attached. And then I know we talked a little bit at the IMPACT conference about assigning characteristics, going and thinking about who are the free school meals kids, who are the SEN kids, who are the EAL kids, and so on and so forth. We've sent a guide about how to fill in the spreadsheet, and Jess is going to go through that at the end, how to import all your data. But if you want that one-to-one -one time with us, you are more than welcome to have it. The next thing that you will need to do is you'll need to organize a two-week window in order to complete the STAR test. This may mean going and organizing for computers. You will either need computers, laptops, or iPads to go and have the kids use that, and you'll want to put a shortcut to your site on there. If you do not yet have your site, don't worry, we will get that to you soon. It may be for one reason or another, if you did not come to the IMPACT conference, we gave out all the usernames and passwords and the site address there. If you weren't able to attend that, we can send you all that information at the end of the, the meeting today. If you are a recent joining to the trial, to the um, to the study here, what you may find is that it's just that your site hasn't been created yet because it's been too soon since you joined. Or if you haven't told us whether your school would prefer the reading test or the math test, we may not have gone and created your site yet because we need that information before we can put that together. Again, not a big deal. Just let us know and we will go and we will put everything in place for you. The next thing you'll want to do is you'll want to go and provide students with their usernames and passwords. And I'm going to show you how to do that now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my web browser very quickly. And apologies, I'm on, there we go. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you what you would need to do first in order to be able to provide the children with their passwords. At this point, I am assuming that you have already imported your data. Now, I know a lot of people haven't. That's not a big deal. I just want you to know what you're going to do next once you've done that. So before you have the kids go and log on, you're just going to click on Users, and you're going to click on View Students. You just pick your class. So. I can see I've got my star teach first class, and I'm going to click search. And you can see what comes up is the class enrollment and another tab here that says passwords. And if I click on passwords, I can actually print this page or I can view it as a PDF and save it. And then I have that ready to go so I can just go around to my kids and say, all right, your username is Renaissance. One and your password's ABC, or your username's Renaissance Four, and your password is ABC. You can go and have it so the kids can change their passwords the first time they log in. That's up to you. We can go and show you how to do that if that is something you're interested in. And while we're in here, I just want to draw your attention to the top right-hand corner where we have live chat support available. This is, no matter where you are in our site, always available to you. So if you have any questions at all, you just click on that, and whoever um, is on our chat that day will go and quickly answer any queries you have and help direct you to the right place to find what you're looking for. Just going to click back on the home page. So that's the very first thing you would do. The second thing that you may want to do is, I'm just going to use Star Reading, but you will either see one tile that says Star Maps or one tile that says Star Reading when you come into the site. You will not see any of these other tiles. These are just part of our demonstration site. So if I click on Star Reading, I can go to Resources, and in here, I have things like the pretest instructions and tips for getting started. So this is just going to have a couple of key resources, and it's exactly the same if you're in Star Maps, that will just go and may help us make the test feel a little more formal. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment and just come back to my PowerPoint. 
The other thing you'll need to do is then test your students. So once you have the usernames and passwords, it's really simple. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. And then the final thing you'll need to do is print your screening report, which again, that's just to prepare for our next session. You won't actually need to look at it, anything beforehand. We will go through that when we have our next session on the 27th. So preparing to test. There are a couple of things that we are going to talk about. First thing I want to do, though, is I want to make sure everybody knows how to use our annotation tools because I'm actually going to ask you to annotate on our whiteboard in a second with some of the ideas you may have. So if you could just click the arrow in the top left-hand corner of your screen and then click anywhere at all on the screen so that your name will appear. Thanks, Jem. I can see that you've immediately got started and Lydia's there. Great. Once you've done that, you'll see right next to it there is a text icon that you can click. If you go and you click on that text icon, you can then go and next to your name, just type hello or hi to me so that I can see that you've got everything ready to go. And if you click away from your text immediately afterward, it will appear. So I can see Jim said hi, Lydia said hello, hello Lydia, hello Jess, a couple more people. Hi, Sean Harriet, and hello to the person whose name I'm not quite sure is because I've got the number. Um, hi, Laura. I can't quite see your text yet. You might just need to click away once you've hit the text box. So thank you so much, everybody, for going and showing me that you guys know how to use the tools. It's just gonna, it was just a quick exercise because I do want to make this session a little bit interactive. So one of the things we do find is that sometimes the kids are not great at doing the test the second time. The first time they take it, they're very serious about it because they aren't familiar with it. But the second time they go to take the test, it's often a bit of an issue because they're like, oh, we've, we're familiar with this, we know this. And sometimes the kids try to do things like because it's a computer adaptive test, they'll just go and click C every single time for every single question. And so of course you end up with a result, but it's not an accurate one. So we want to make sure that they take this test really seriously. And we just had a quick activity for you to do. If your text is yellow, if you could just change it in the color there. How do you ensure fidelity of testing at your school? Can you give us some of your tips just so we can all steal ideas from each other? I'll give you some of mine, but if you could go and give me some of your tips, just grab your arrow, find a place on the screen to go and click, and then I will type in what I did at my school. You can go and type in what you are doing in your school. But share with us what you're doing to go and create those testing conditions, and that would be really helpful. Just give everybody a second to type something. Okay, Jem regularly circulates around the room. We made our kids leave their bags in the front room and then we put them in a seating plan. We were very strict about that. We would, even if we were in the library, they'd sit every other seat, um, little things like that. Um, Lydia said reward for progress and improvement. That's a great one. Always dangling the carrot to go and get the kids to take it really seriously. Um, Sean Harriet said clear instructions. The pre-test instructions may help that with that because not only will it give clear instructions for the star test, but it will help make it feel that bit more formal. Jess has put that the children wear silent headphones to help them ignore distractions. One of our primary schools does that. Um, they also, we have a primary school who uses books, makes the kids put book up around their iPad so that nobody else can see, which we found really amusing. Um, anything else that you can think of? I know some schools will do things, bags left elsewhere and clear instructions on expectations, great. We've had everything from you know, nothing can be on your person to um, not letting the kids start the test until the teacher says go, even if um, some people are logged in and others are not. And so that's great. Thank you so much for everybody who shared. Um, Sean Harriet, if you have typed something, I can't quite see it. You may need to just click away very quickly and then it'll appear for me to see. Oh, you make them retaste, retest if they complete it too quickly. That's a great idea. And actually, and testing in the IT room to change the environment. Both of those are great suggestions. So if you always are going and testing in the library, going and suddenly testing in the IT room can go and make it feel a bit different and going and perhaps thinking about giving them a specific amount of time it should take and if they finish it too quickly, going and making them test again. So 
Thanks so much, everybody. What we want to do is we do want to ensure those tests are completed in exam conditions. You can use the pretest instructions or our classroom presentation, and I'm actually going to show you what that looks like now. So I'm going to share my web browser again. And on that Teach First hidden page on our website, which is um, teachfirst.co.uk. Oh, sorry, I seem to have annotation tools on. There we go. Um, if we go into the autumn term and we click on September, it has a lot of information. Don't worry too much right now. The things that I want to draw your attention to is we have a video which is about preparing your students for the first STAR test. One of our teachers who has used the program for years, we actually filmed her talking to her New Year 7s about what they should be thinking about when they go to do the STAR test for the first time. And that video is there for you to watch if you need some ideas. If you are using our STAR math test, you can go and click on this, this particular link. And if you're using the STAR reading test, it's this one. We also have the STAR reading PowerPoint for primaries. But if I were to click on the PDF, it will just bring up a really quick presentation that you can use in your classroom to explain to the kids what they're doing. And it just goes through. If you've not taken one before, it's going to begin with some practice questions. It's going to be really simple. You're going to fill in the gap. That's all it is. For the, it's going to be that for the first couple of questions. And then once they finish the practice questions, they can move on to the test. It reminds them they'll have 34 questions, and it tells them how they can choose their answer. After the first 10 questions, where they pick the word that best fits the sentence, they move on to questions 11 to 34. These are skill-based questions, so it's getting them to think about things like theme or character and so on and so forth. It will adapt all the way down to kids who are just learning to read, and it will go all the way up to the end of the school curriculum. So you have some ideas of what it's going to ask them. There is a time limit, which you can extend. And you will see a warning when they're almost at the time. And if they go and they don't know the answer, they can go and let it time out. And that's what we actually suggest. We don't suggest they guess, because if they guess correctly, it's going to get harder. And remember that. And then if they guess correctly again, it's going to get harder beyond that. And actually, if they keep guessing and guess correctly a few times in a row, it can actually inflate their scores a little bit. It doesn't happen often, but this will just help prevent anomalies from occurring. And then it just goes through those basic things that they shouldn't be doing during a test, like talking or distracting and so on and so forth, helping their friends. So all of that is there for you to go and download, save to your computer, and share with your kids. And that brings me to one other thing I need to show you right here. When you are ready to go and star test your kids, I'm going to use the maths one this time. It's exactly the same in both you may need to go into your preferences and for your children who have specific access arrangements because they have SEN needs, you can give them extra time. And the way you do that is just by coming in, selecting your class. You can then go and you can edit student preferences. And if, for example, I know that this student here is really working more at a year four level, I can change that. And if I know these two students would normally get extra time in exams or in tests, then I can go and I can put the extended time limit on. And I just click Save, and then that's done. So before they take the test, that's really all you need to do is just make sure that you've set the preferences. You only have to do that one time in the year before they go to the first test. After that, it will just pick up where they left off last time. I'm going to show you very quickly what the kids see. So I'm just going to go and log out and log in as a student. And when the kids log in, they will have one tile that will either say star reading or star maths. When they click on it, it's going to ask for a password. This password, no matter where you are in the site, whenever it asks you for a password, it is admin. You can remove that if you want. Um, you can just go and ask us and we'll fill you in on how to do that. So you can see here, it's going to start with a couple of practice questions. 
potentially. It may not because actually I did this earlier today. So what I was showing is school it. So normally it would have a couple of practice questions that would be really simple. Right now, because of the fact that I've already done it once today, it's actually going and asking me some more challenging ones because it knows that I am in secondary school, my mock student. But you can see the kind of questions it gives you. The kids can actually click on each word to read it in the sentence, which is often very helpful for weaker students. And until they click next, it doesn't accept their, that as their answer. And you'll see I'm running out of time, so the clock is appearing. And I know, obviously, that I answered that question incorrectly. Hopefully, this will then adjust down to go and adapt to the fact that I didn't know the answer there. If I ever need to at any point, to stop the test, if I have a student, for example, who's getting really panicked or is really distracted and I can see that they just need to walk away and perhaps finish this at another time, I can hit stop test on that top right hand corner. I can choose to stop it entirely, which will disregard the test, or I can click resume later, which again, just admin, and I can go and finish this at a later point then. Now, if you have a fire drill at some point, which you know, it does happen, and you need the kids to be able to save where they are in the test. If they just exit out, it saves their space, so you don't need to worry. And I'm just going to go back in as a teacher. And once I go back in as a teacher, I will be able to go and find out a little bit about how the kids have done, which I'm not going to go through just yet. I'm actually going to click Stop Sharing. Okay, so the goal is is to encourage all the students to have been tested within two weeks. That two-week window is quite important because we compare the kids nationally. Now, in order to give you the most accurate information, the closer together they test, the better the data is going to be for you. It's going to give you a much more accurate picture of how they compare to their national peers. So if you can get them all star tested within two weeks, that's great. If it does need to for a longer period than that because you have kids who are off on, on long-term illness or whatever it is, just be aware that if it is beyond 30 days, some children will have had more curriculum instruction time than others, and so you, in one of the reports, you won't be able to pull up all the same information about the same kids in the same place. You'll still be able to access that information in other places. It'll just prevent you from running one of the reports the way that you may want to. So some of the things you may want to consider is using our PowerPoint, whether or not you need to adjust any starting levels to provide extra time for your students, and how regularly you will test. Some of the things you may also want to think about is when are the best times in the day for you to test your kids. If you know, for example, that they have had lunch right before, they might be a little bit more focused. If you know that they are at it's the last lesson before the end of the day and you know they're going to be really distracted, you know, it, it just depends on what you, your classes are like. You know your students. Think about when you think it'll be best for them to do that and try to organize it in that lesson of that week. So I know I always tried to get mine start tested first thing in the morning because I tended to get them when they were at their best if I did that, especially if it was earlier on in the week. Um, and then also think about what you can have the kids do who finish early. I, my personal recommendation is get the kids to sit down, put a timer that's set for 20 minutes, but count, have the timer counting up instead of down. And this is because the test is meant to take 20 minutes. If they're taking less than 20 minutes, they may be rushing it, and therefore they may not necessarily get the results that you would expect. And so if you set that timer for 20 minutes, it doesn't put any pressure on any of the kids who haven't finished when the timer runs out. Instead, it just counts up and you can spot if anybody's rushed the test because they finished early. You may want to think about whether or not you have a book for them to go and read. If they're in the library, that makes it really easy. If you're in an IT room or something like that or in a regular classroom, is there something they could be getting on with right afterward so that they don't distract others? Um, in terms of reports and interventions, I'm going to move on to that in a second. I wanted to address a couple of things that people had asked me about. Some people had said in email saying that, you know, we've been looking at the Teach First site and we were a little bit concerned about what we're being asked to do. Can you just go through that? So I just wanted to go through a couple of things. You've obviously got your two webinars. This first one's the one you're attending now, and this other one is the one that is on the 27th. It's probably going to be 45 minutes. And you can go and you can you can finish that soon. I'm being told that you can't see my web browser for some reason yet, which is a bit odd. Let me see if I can fix that. I will share it again. 
Okay. So, the first webinar you've already attended. This is the one you're attending now. The second one is coming up soon. And then beyond that, you'll see that we have some resources for the LDOs who might be involved in Teach First. And one of those is a learning walk form to use if observing star testing. And some people were worried about that and whether or not they're going to be observed. I honestly can't answer very much about that. It was something we put together at the request of Teach First. We, um, we wanted, they wanted to know what perfect star testing looked like. And so we created this document as to what it would be, what would be ideal to be seeing in the classroom. So you can see we put things like sharing the presentation with the class, sharing your expectations, providing a post test activity, thinking about how you create that testing environment, and then we have just some key things, so really simple things you would expect anyway. And I apologize if any of this seems really obvious. We just put all of that together because we were asked to think about those key things. Beyond that, these resources that you have here, they're basically all the things that you need to do, that, um, and they're just to give you those extra steps along the way in case you need any help with it. Beyond that, it's just making sure that you've assigned extra time in the starting levels, and then you've star tested the kids and looked for any anomalies. And we're going to look for those anomalies together in the next webinar. So really, you're just getting your kids star tested. That's all you need to be able to do when you leave here today. And if you're worried about that in any way, you have live chat support available, as we mentioned. You can email me or Jess, who's put her email in the chat box, for further coaching support, and you can have some one-to-one -one support with us. And we also have telephone training support available for any teachers who need further assistance. So if somebody from your school wasn't able to attend today, and you've already imported your data, but they haven't imported theirs, don't worry. We can take them through that. And you can see after September, you won't have to worry about doing anything else until December. So I'm just going to go and come back to my PowerPoint very quickly. I'm going to give you a little taster of what's coming next, and then we're going to go and finish off hopefully a little early. So what you do need to know how to do before your next session is how to run the STAR screening report. And this is what we're going to focus on in the next session to make sure that we go and we can use this information to then inform the practices we're putting in place. And so. Does anybody know where you find this report? If you have an idea, can you just tell me in the chat box? If you don't, it's okay, but if you remember from either the Teach First conference session or if because if you have happened to use the system before or have played around with it a little bit, has anybody found this report? Do you know where it is? If not, you can give me a little cross so that I know that you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay, too. Kick her across. Okay, Lydia's not sure. That's okay. We're going to go through it now. Anybody else know where they can find it? If you don't, that's okay. Jess, I'm glad that you do. <laughs> Jess is um, one of the members of my team and is obviously the person who you've been hearing from so much on chat. So, Okay, so I can see a couple people know where to find it and a couple people don't, and that's absolutely fine. I'm just going to show you what you can do, and does anybody know what you have to do before running it? If you know what you have to do before running it, can you put that in the chat box? Does anybody remember that from the conference? No? All right. So last thing I'm going to share with you, let me come back here very quickly. Okay, so before you can do anything, whether you have the STAR reading and the STAR math test, it doesn't matter, you need to click in and go to Screening Progress Monitoring and Intervention. You don't need to worry about this until you finish STAR testing, but you just need to go in and click View Screening Dates up here on the left-hand side. It automatically sets the first set of screening dates for you as a two-week period, but you may want to go and expand that so that it's all of September. So you can see here we've changed ours, so it goes from the beginning of September till the end of it, just to make sure that I get every kid who is tested at that point. If you know that you're going to test in the middle of December because you want to give yourself or at the beginning of December because you know that that last week they're going to be really distracted, you can go and you can put in those dates now if you would like in your site. Um, and then for the spring term, which is really your summer testing, you can go and you can think about the dates you want in June. You may want to put those in your school calendar now and just make sure that you've got all that in the system. You just have to do this once and click Save, and then you'll be able to run the report. To get to the screening report, no matter which 
site you're in, you just click on reports, and the screening report is the third one down. And you'll need to select the year group that you teach, and then you'll need to just select all of these boxes and click view report. Once you've done that, you can print this off and you can bring it to our next session and you will have all the information that you need to, we're going to go through. So don't worry too much about anything else right now. We're going to take you through this and then we're going to take you through what you can do with the information you have here. So if you remember this from our session when we, we did it, the Teach First Impact Conference, great. We're going to go through this in a lot more detail in terms of what you can do with the information and how you can plan your interventions. And if you don't remember this because it's the first time you're seeing it, we're going to explain it in the next session a little bit first before we go into all those things. So don't worry too much at all. So this program is so important because it's really helping close the gap between reading age and chronological age and helping children who struggle with numeracy go and catch up and those who are flying with it really go and step up their game and make that accelerated progress. And it is, there are a few other reports that we will also talk through next time, things like the summary report where we can go and rank our students. We'll also start thinking about the different things we can use for intervention, like the suggested skills report, the book level that it provides, and perhaps the interventions you're using, having that be evaluated using our progress monitoring tools. I'm not going to go through all the reports that are in the system. There are so many of them. We're going to go through one in a lot of depth next time, and we're going to go through and touch on a couple of others. In the meantime, if you can focus on the first step here, which is just making sure your students test with fidelity, monitor what's going on, and pick out any problems. If you notice the kid's having an off day, that's absolutely fine. If they seem to have some serious test anxiety and you think, oh, they're going to end up with a really off score because of that, that's okay too. Just go and highlight those kids now because it means that you'll remember next time when they go to do the next STAR test that maybe they might need to be STAR tested in a separate room or you might need to just pull those couple of kids aside and just make sure that they feel really prepared. So just wanted to touch on those couple of things. And we are going to move on to this last bit of importing student data. And before we do that, I just wanted to remind everybody, our next webinar is September 27th. It's at 4 p.m. I will aim for it to be about 45 minutes long with an extra 15 minutes for questions, the same as today. I am actually with Today's session, I'm going to pass it over to Jess for the last 15 minutes for anybody who has not yet imported their student data. If you've imported your student data, and I know a couple people have, some people have done it for one class but not the other, there have been, there's been, I know, at least one school that's imported everything, that's great. If you need some support with that, we're going to talk through how to do that in a moment. So I'm, if you've done that already, you are welcome to leave. Thank you so much for coming to our session today. And if you haven't done that, please stick around. We're going to just take 10 minutes to go through that quickly, and then we will have you off to go and enjoy that beautiful sunshine. So thanks so much. And I am going to actually swap seats with Jess, so I, you could just give me a second. Hello. As uh, Lauren mentioned, uh, they're just going to swap over. If you do need help, with importing, do stay on this session for a couple more minutes. Jess will walk you through. If you do want to leave, you can now press the cross button on the top right hand corner and leave the session. Jess will be taken over just for a couple more minutes just to help you walk through importing of your data. I'm going to pass over back to Jess, but those that are leaving us, thank you for your time um, and we look forward to welcoming you at the next session. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for hanging around, as you've probably heard, it's not going to take too long. Okay, so basically the, the reason we're asking you to import in this spreadsheet is that it creates all your student accounts, it creates all your classes as quickly as possible. Now everything you'll need to do this is on that timeline, the Teacher First timeline, just under that first section. So you see there's a data import guide. So that will go through some of the steps I covered today and a template for you to place your data into. And of course, as we mentioned already, if you do have any questions or you'd actually like someone to be on the phone while you import the data in, that's absolutely fine. Just give us a call or organise a time and we'll sort of do, do it at your own, um, when your own you're available even. So all the resources are there.
Now, the first thing you're going to need to do is create that spreadsheet. Now, the system is a little bit fussy, so I just want to give you a few tips. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is, of course, that there aren't any children's names on the system. That's because all the children's data does have to be anonymous. So, in terms of their details, like their names, we're asking for their first name to be your school's name. It doesn't have to be you know, the entire thing, but just something to indicate your school's identity. And then each child will be given an identity number. That particular number, that will become their student ID and also become their username. So in terms of the other data, it's all pretty simple. You've got their year group. Now, this has to be a single year. So if you put year seven or Y7, remember, you won't, it won't import it in. So just leave it as a single digit. You'll have their gender just as an F or an M. And then you've got characteristics. Now, characteristics are basically tags that you can assign to students so that we can filter reports. So, for example, you might like to see how much growth is typically achieved by a child with free school meals compared to those who aren't. Now, the certain characteristics that Teach First are particularly interested in, and these are the ones we'll import in. However, later on, you can always add your own in, so if there's anything in particular you would like to track. Now, each of the characteristics has a little code. You can see it at the bottom. So, for example, FM will be free school meals. EAL, that's a pretty obvious one. And then there's two special needs groups. So SE is just simply special educational needs. Well, LDIF, LDIF is special educational needs, but they actually have an EHC plan or they're statemented. So this information should be available on SIMS. Um, though if for any reason you can't add it in now, if that information isn't available to you for any reason, Fine for now, just contact us and we'll show you how to add it in at a later date. But this has had to be in it overall. Um, if they do have multiple characteristics, so they have free school meals and their English and additional language, then just take a dash in between them. And Lydia, that spreadsheet is available on the timeline, which is under renlearn.co.uk forward slash teach first. So you'll find the example spreadsheet and the guide. Now, it's always going to ask your students' date of birth. This is because, as Lawrence already mentioned, we're going to be comparing their growth to kids all around the country to see where they rank. It's really useful data in terms of tracking growth. Now, the system is a little bit fussy. Basically, decades ago, we were a US firm. Um, of course, nowadays, we're not. But what this means is that if you don't change some of the preferences, it tries to change the dates into US ones, which is really annoying. So once you've put the dates of birth in, what you need to do is go to that particular column, you just right click and go to format cells, and as you see on the bottom right, you see that there's the option to go to date, and that we will select the third date down. So it's the date, which is the form of DD forward slash MM forward slash YYYY, but it does not have an asterisk. That's really important. Make sure it's the third one down, no asterisks. Otherwise, it won't import any child who's unlucky enough to be born after the 12th of each month. Um, on top of that, as I said, each child's going to have their username, which is the same as the ID number. And we recommend for now just giving all the students the same password. We often choose ABC, but you can choose something else if you wish. So before we move on to the next bit, does anyone have any questions? Feel free just to stick it into chat. And Lauren's put up the link to that example spreadsheet so you can always see all the data live on that if you wish. Okay, the other half of the spreadsheet is about the class information. So this is pretty simple to fill in. Now, just for our system, every single student has to be in a course basically the umbrella term where all the classes sit within. We recommend just putting in a course name, just like star, just something on that line. It doesn't have to be anything more complicated than that. For the class name, we'd like you to use a specific class name rather than the name of your own class, like you know, 7E or anything like that. So if this class is being taught by a Teach First teacher, they're going to be in class one. If they're being taught by someone who's not Teach First, can you put them into class two? 
So one is teach first, two will be not teach first. And as you can see, there's then columns for you to fill in with your name and the username and password that you wish to use. So that's the spreadsheet. So you just want to grab the information. We normally can grab it from Sims, but you can always put it elsewhere. Um, and as I said earlier, just remember that once you create a spreadsheet, remember to anonymize the data just so that we won't have the information in the system. So do keep it for your own records so you know who's who. Okay, now in terms of importing it in, I'm not going to be able to show you that live because it just takes a little bit too long. So I'm gonna go show you just through screenshots, but it is a really simple process. Now the first thing to make sure you do is to, that you go to the right website address. Now it sounds a bit obvious, but basically every single school who uses AR in the world, and you know that's tens of thousands of schools around the world, they all have their own unique website address. So if you go onto the wrong one by accident, so 408, for example, your username and password will not work. Um, the username and password um, would have been provided already, but if you don't have it, just let us know, and we can just send it over to you again. So you just log in as a teacher, and then as we've already been to this area already, you're just going to be going to users. That's where you add in the accounts, and there's a button called import information. So it's a really obvious button near the bottom. This is just going to take you through a really short process um, to get that data in. So the first thing it's going to do is just ask you just to find that file. So just find the file on the desktop or wherever else you've saved it. And then just select a few pieces of information. So it's pretty obvious things. It's things like, you know, what is academic year? Just make sure you select this current school year whether or not that first row you're importing is actually student information, or as in this case, it's just header information, it's just in case it accidentally misses out a student. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna bring up your spreadsheet and just ask you to confirm, is this the right information in this column? So it just wants to make sure it doesn't accidentally import in you know, student's ID number as their name, for example. So you just look along that top row and just check everything matches up as it should. And then for all the rest of the preferences, because this is the first time you've imported into the site, you just click on next. Don't worry about making any changes at all. Go to the bottom right and just keep clicking next, 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 until you get to the last page where, as you see, there's the option to start this import. If you're a little unsure, it does tell you about how many kids it's recognized, how many classes, and how many teachers. So you can always just double check that little list here to, just to check it's not missed anybody out. If you do have any issues, if it pop up, pops up saying anything's gone wrong, just give us a call or drop us an email, and as we've said, we will be very happy to help you. So that's the import itself. Um, as an earlier, just feel free to put any questions into chat. Now what I want to quickly go through is just a little bit of admin on the site. So for example, if you did have to miss out information, how do you actually update it? Um, how do you change someone's date of birth if you've realized it's gone wrong? That sort of thing. So I'm just going to take us back onto our site. Okay. and. Um, again, on our Teach First site, there are guides on how to do many of these tasks. So feel free just to pop onto there if you do have any questions or use live chat, drop me an email. So there's only two places I would want you to double check. The first thing is we want to know, did your kids' accounts actually get created? So for that, we're going to be going back into users and they're going to be going to view students. So I'm just going to go and select any old class. Of course, you'd have a few more kids in your class unless you're very, very lucky. And we're back on this page. So you've got your passwords on the right-hand side and the class information on the left. So if you needed to change any details, so let's say um, you did put in incorrect dates of birth, or perhaps you weren't able to add in your free school meals information. All you need to do is click onto a child's name 
and you've got their personnel area. So on the left hand side under details, you can see that you can change their gender, their year group, their date of birth. You can also add in additional information like ethnicity and language if you wish. And then there's a tab just to the right of this, which is then characteristics. So you can see some of these characteristics are ones you'd recognize, others are characteristics that have been created by teachers on the system. So you can just come in here and pick which characteristics a particular child has. And that is it. You don't have to do anything else on the student level. Just make sure that you've recognized who's free school meals, who's special needs, and who's EAL. And just double check that you know, they do have a gender, that they're not accidentally being put into the wrong year group, that sort of thing. So all of this is done. If I go back to the very beginning, under users, view students, and just click on search, and your kids will appear. Okay, so they've got accounts on here, so I'm happy with that. But I want to make sure that they've been assigned to the right class. I'll, I might want to make changes, so you know, maybe a student's moved from one, one teacher's class to another. So that second button I mentioned is just to the right here, courses and classes. Courses and classes is just where you match up teachers with their students. You will not have all of these options here. You'll simply have your star option, which you can click into, that course name, and your two classes will appear. And if you want to make any changes at all, click on a class name, and you've got another little menu. So you can change the name, you can change the teacher, and also um, you can assign the products. So if for example, the kids can't see the programs to double check this, or add a move students. So, you know, if I quickly search for any old students under Renaissance, I could add them into my class. Now, these tasks you won't generally have to do very often, so don't worry too much about this. The main thing is making sure your kids have all the major information, like gender and free school meals, and that they are in a class so the teacher can see the correct information and the kids can access the products. Okay, so as I said, if you have any questions about that, feel free just to pop back um, or go onto the timeline and you're going to find all the information and guides which will go through these steps again. Um, but otherwise, I quickly skip through this. Your next, as Lauren said, the next sort of formal piece of contact you're going to have with us is to do with the next webinar on September the 27th. So all you need to do is just get your data imported, start test your kids, and just print off that screening report that Lauren showed you. So does anyone have any final questions or would you like us to recap anything? I think it's just Lydia, just, it's only you here at the moment, sorry I didn't realise. So Lydia, how are you feeling? Do you have any questions? Okay, so I'm guessing you're okay, Lydia. Um, so we'll hover around just for a few more minutes, just in case you are still around. But otherwise, thank you very much.